Welcome viewers to our ongoing program, Nuclear Free Future, coming to you from Channel 17, Center for Media and Democracy. And I am your host, Margaret Harrington, for the past several years. And our guest today is returning Kevin Camps from Beyond Nuclear. Welcome back, Kevin. Thanks so much for having me, Margaret. Yes, and of course we're in strange circumstances here. Our title for the, the, for the program is Beyond Nuclear During the Pandemic. So Kevin, where are you right now and how has the, the uh, coronavirus affected your work in Beyond Nuclear? Well, I'm in Kalamazoo, Michigan, which is my hometown and I'm at my mother's house, um, just being here with her during this crazy time. And uh, it, is affecting our work in a very dramatic way because the nuclear power industry is really taking full advantage of the pandemic as an excuse to get away with murder. So exemptions and deferrals and safety regulation rollbacks that they've long sought for not even years but decades, here's a great chance to get away with it. And so the first indication we had of what was coming was on March 20th the Nuclear Regulatory Commission had not set a peep about the coronavirus pandemic, even though a uh, national emergency had already been declared sometime before that. <clears throat> but they held a meeting, a first meeting with industry on March 20th, and it was clear from the start that the industry had a lot of demands, and the NRC was only too happy to rubber stamp every one of them. So some examples would be deferring safety inspections deferring maintenance, uh, waivers from having to replace safety significant systems and structures and components that needed replacement. And even things like uh, increasing working hours from 12, hour, 12 hours a day maximum to 16 hours per day maximum for nuclear workers, increasing work hours per week from a maximum of 72 to 86. And they've done it all. And this is being applied across the country at nuclear plants uh, left and right. Another big dynamic of the pandemic at this time is there are a very large number, scores of nuclear fueling, I'm sorry, nuclear refueling outages where huge workforces come in, 1,000 to 2,000 temporary workers for a month. And these people travel from plant to plant to plant across the country. There's some question about, certainly they are introducing the coronavirus to the nuclear power plants themselves but a maybe bigger question is are these workforces these itinerant workforces bringing coronavirus to places that didn't have it before so places like limerick pennsylvania the nuclear power plant there uh, fermi nuclear power plant in michigan and when they're done at a nuclear plant in the refueling they move on to the next one somewhere else in the country so that's all going on. And another really shameful dynamic is that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is uh, announcing public comment periods and setting deadlines. And so here we are in the midst of a pandemic having to meet deadlines. And uh, one of them was just last night. It was actually the De Department of Energy National Nuclear Security Administration held a webinar only or phone in public comment meeting on their proposal to start making plutonium pits for nuclear weapons for the first time at Savannah Riverside, South Carolina. So it's really shameful. Um, in my personal work area, fighting the dump targeted at New Mexico, Holtec International Consolidated Interim Storage Facility for high-level radioactive waste, they have set a deadline. It's July 22nd, and so we are scrambling now to try to get people engaged uh, in the middle of a national emergency, in the middle of a deadly global pandemic, to meet this deadline that they are set on letting this clock run down. And we're, we're protesting it because in-person public comment meetings, of course, can't happen during this time. And fortunately for us, the New Mexico US congressional delegation is standing strong and insisting that at least five public comment meetings in person take place in New Mexico. And we're gonna try to get a couple dozen more in a dozen other states across the country along the transportation routes. And so far, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is dead set against doing that. But we faced okay. the same obstacles 20 years ago with the Yucca Mountain proposal, and we fought hard and we got the Department of Energy to hold these public comment meetings along the transportation routes. Kevin, can you give us the, uh, the, the web, your website 
you know, we will also put it on the screen, but just for viewers right now who want to make a public comment, they have all the information on Beyond Nuclear's website. So please give that right now. Yeah, our website is www.beyondnuclear.org. And I certainly will put all this on the homepage and we have a section called centralized storage. That's where this Holtac information is featured. And uh, I, I just put on our homepage an item about the nuclear decommissioning community advisory panel in Vermont that's going to meet on Monday, May 4th. So if folks are able to tune into that by webinar or by phone, and there will be a recording as well. So folks who miss it in real time can still watch what happened. And uh, there are so many things happening. Uh, for example, some good news just last night. So that would have been April 30th at 11 p.m. Eastern, the Indian Point unit number two atomic reactor shut down near New York City. And it turns out that the Nuclear Information and Resource Service, NEARS, is conducting a webinar next week. That'll be on Wednesday, May 6th. And again, if folks can plug in in real time, great. Otherwise, I hope it'll be recorded so you can watch it later because uh, they need um, help pushing back against the pro-nuclear industry uh, lobbyists and propagandists who are using the shutdown of Indian Point Unit Number 2 to try to prop up the operations of Indian Point 3, um, which is supposed to close a year from now, but they're going to try to, you know, get it out of having to close down. They're also trying to use it nationally as a warning that, you know, there are going to be blackouts if nuclear power plants close, which is not the truth. It's, it's a falsehood, but they're saying it. They're writing op-eds and letters to the editor. And we saw this same dynamic uh, some months back at Three Mile Island Unit one in Pennsylvania, which shut down last September, thankfully. Unit two was the one that had the meltdown in 1979. So there was all this clamor by the pro-nuclear voices saying, um, don't let this happen to you. Don't let your nuclear plant be shut down. And it unfortunately gets traction in some places. I mean, I'm sitting in Southwest Michigan. You may be able to see the signs behind me. One of them is an anti-Palisade sign. And uh, Entergy, the same company that owns Indian Point and Pilgrim, also owns Palisades, and uh, they have kept Palisades open way too long. It's pushing a half century of operations, and uh, they're not set to close now until October of 2022. They said they were going to close in 2018, and then they added four more years on top, and uh, it was devastating because this is a very dangerous reactor. Indian Point Unit 3 and Palisades have something in common in a bad way. It's called uh, reactor pressure vessel embrittlement. It's where the neutrons coming off the core have poked astronomical numbers of small microscopic holes in the metal of the reactor pressure vessel. And like a hot glass under cold water, if the emergency core cooling system is ever activated in an emergency, you could fracture through wall the reactor pressure vessel because it's at 2,000 pounds of pressure per square inch and it's at 600 degrees Fahrenheit. So if this cold water rushes in to try to prevent a meltdown, it could cause the meltdown because you fracture the vessel, there's no contingency and you'd better hope your containment holds. But we saw at Fukushima Daiichi that containments are sometimes damaged, sometimes destroyed, and the radioactivity flows into the environment. Those are the risks they're running at Palisades right now and at Indian Point Unit 3 for at least another year. And we hope that we can shorten that time and get Indian Point closed completely before then. Okay, but the pressure from the nuclear industry is very strong now and they're taking the opportunity of the coronavirus to go about their machinations. Yeah. It's horrible. And, and yes. uh, Kevin, um, what about the continued transport from Vermont Yankee here in Vermont by North Star? Now, I saw this, is, it's old news from back in March, but they have been lax in transporting the, uh, the low-level nuclear waste to Texas. Could you, could you talk about that? It's, it's been extended from 20 days to, to 60 days or something like that? Yeah, that was a great article by Susan Small here in the Brattleboro Reformer. Um, it's, uh, it's frightening because what's happening is uh, there are supposed to be time limits on how long a shipment of so-called low-level radioactive waste takes to get from Vermont Yankee 
decommissioning nuclear power plant out to these dump sites, places like waste control specialists in West Texas. And instead of, like you said, 20 days for that journey, which is hard to believe that it would take 20 days to go from Vermont to West Texas by rail, instead it's taking 60 days in some cases. And so the company, North Star, that's conducting the decommissioning has asked for an exemption, yet another exemption from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Hey, can we take 45 days? Can we take 60 days to get the waste from Vermont Yankee out to these dump sites? Another dump site is uh, Energy Solutions, formerly called EnviroCare in uh, Western Utah. These are the so-called low-level radioactive waste dumps in the country. And uh, what's frightening is they kept saying the uh, North Star and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, when quoted in this article, I think it was dated March 2nd of 2020. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, they kept saying, oh, we didn't lose track of the shipment. We knew where the shipment was the whole time. And it's like they protest too much. <laughs> so what is happening with these shipments? I mean, uh, they mentioned in the article that they, they sit on rail sidings somewhere, rail yards somewhere in middle America. I don't know where. The problem is this is radioactive waste. And they even uh, went out of their way to say, oh, we pack it really well. We really pack it in there with, you know, thick materials as if it's radiation shielding. If, if this waste is giving off gamma radiation, even neutron radiation, and there's a lot of shenanigans being played these days, always have been, but they're going for it again right now in a big way. Uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has this new um, proposal that they're floating out there in the middle of a pandemic that they would love to hear public comment on. It's called very low level waste. So low level that um, the NRC is thinking about, and they've tried this over decades and they've never gotten away with it. And Diane DeRigo at NEARS is a real champion in stopping this time and time again. They want to allow um, regular garbage dumps and regular recycling centers to start taking what they're now calling very low level waste. So low, you really don't need to worry about it. And you really don't need a special permit, just fill out this form and we'll let your garbage dump start taking this. So we'll let your recycling center start taking this. And it's incredible, it's really scary because as I mentioned, gamma radiation especially, but perhaps even neutrons, depending on what's in that waste, if it's set, sitting on a rail siding for days at a time or weeks at a time, <clears throat> people that are near there, the workers at that rail yard, the people who happen to live next door to that rail yard, depending on how close you come to that train car, it sounds like there's some real wiggle room in terms of radiation shielding, and you could be getting a dose, a prolonged dose. And so we call this a mobile x-ray machine that can't be turned off. And the Nuclear Regulatory Commission allows what they call allowable or permissible dose rates of emissions to come off of such shipments. And allowable or permissible does not mean safe. It means they've done a cost benefit analysis at the NRC headquarters. And they've decided that the cost to the industry is reasonable and the cost to human health is reasonable and the benefit to the profit motive of North Star is reasonable and they're going to allow this. And it's uh, requiring watchdogging. And that article was a real red flag that um, they are weakening the rules and they may have lost track of some of these shipments. And it harkens back to a government accountability office report that was done for Congress several long years ago now, where Vermont Yankee and some other nuclear power plants in the country incredibly lost track of high level radioactive waste. And the uh, conclusion that was reached by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and by Vermont Yankee at the time was, well, yeah, there was this fragment of nuclear fuel, high level radioactive waste that we lost track of. We don't know where it went for sure, but it probably was, mistaken for low-level radioactive waste and it got shipped out to Barnwell, South Carolina and buried in a ditch. And truth be told, that ditch has long been leaking into the surrounding African-American community in the groundwater. <clears throat> so uh, it's scary stuff. It requires constant watchdogging by the citizenry. And also in that article, Kevin, there was an implication that well, uh, b shipping it by rail is the best, but also the possibility of shipping it by truck. Yeah, and uh, you know, we mentioned waste control specialists in West Texas. That is North Star's business partner in all things decommissioning, not just low level so-called radioactive waste disposal on top of the Oglala Aquifer, if you can believe that. 
but um, they have a new proposal now and it's called interim storage partners at waste control specialists it involves north star and its ownership in effect um, alongside vermont yankee of the high level radioactive waste in vermont they want to ship that out there they want to do what's called consolidated interim storage at waste control specialists and just 39 miles away from WCS Texas across the state line into New Mexico. There's a second proposal for consolidated interim storage. It's called Holtec International, which actually provides the uh, high level waste containers at Vermont Yankee. So it's anybody's guess where Vermont Yankee's high level waste would end up. Would it be at Holtec's facility in New Mexico? Would it be at waste control specialists in Texas? It kind of doesn't matter. They're only 39 miles apart. So that's high level waste rolling through the country. And uh, it's a really bad idea because it can't stay at the surface of the earth forever. Um, deep geologic disposal, not at Yucca. Yucca is not suitable in many different ways. The problem is there's a risk that New Mexico and Texas will become by default de facto permanent storage at the surface of the earth. And these high level waste containers are gonna fail someday. In fact, Holtex containers are infamous uh, for violating quality assurance on design and fabrication and whistleblowers brought that to our attention in january of 2003 nrc's done nothing about it since neither has holtec so it's really scary because these whistleblowers oscar shirani at commonwealth edison exelon and dr ross landsman at the nuclear regulatory commission questioned the structural integrity of holtec containers sitting still at zero miles per hour like at Vermont Yankee right now. But what about them going 60 miles per hour down the railways? What if they're in a crash? What if they're in a fire? What if they're submerged underwater in an accident? They really question the seaworthiness of these containers, so to speak, the crash worthiness, the ability to withstand these forces without breaching and releasing their contents. So Kevin, what you're telling us is that the beat is going on, it's getting louder and louder, and, and the nuclear people, the nuclear industry is having their way during the pandemic. So this We're is- We're fighting uh, them hard. Um, yeah. A letter by, spearheaded by NIRS, uh, but signed on to by 90 groups, essentially, um, calling out the NRC on all of these shenanigans, they're, they're taking advantage of the pandemic. Um, and it was sent to Vice President Pence because he's Trump's point man on all things coronavirus. And uh, many agencies were CC'd. Fauci's agency, the Centers for Disease Control was CC'd, OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Administration. I mean, one of the most outrageous claims by NRC thus far is, well, uh, the pandemic is not our responsibility. Uh, nuclear safety is our responsibility. They're pretending like the workforce is not suffering from this pandemic. OSHA has direct responsibility. They are nowhere to be seen. And we've heard poor stories from nuclear workers themselves about Exelon at Limerick, for example, um, Detroit Edison at Fermi Unit 2, not taking this situation seriously, having large workforces in close proximity, standing room only in break rooms uh, during refueling outages. It's just madness <clears throat> it's a you know it's a place where the virus is spreading dramatically we have evidence of it at the Vogel nuclear power plant in Georgia where you have two operating reactors and two reactors under construction the only reactor construction really in the country going on where they've documented over 130 coronavirus positives which means if that work force continues to work there in close proximity, it's going to spread like wildfire. It, it, it is spreading like wildfire. So um, NRC is not behaving themselves very well at this time. And another example would be on Earth Day at 4.59 p.m. This is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, April 22nd. The NRC lets us know a minute before close of business that the next morning they're going to vote on our appeals in the Holtec consolidated storage case um, out of the blue. And the next morning at 11 a.m., uh, they held an affirmation session that lasted a few minutes, if that, and they unanimously voted against us, all four commissioners, on Beyond Nuclear's appeals, on Don't Waste Michigan's appeals. That's a seven-group national grassroots coalition. We are out of the proceeding now, but what that means is we are going straight to federal court. A couple other groups, Sierra Club and an oil company who also oppose the dump 
perhaps an environmental justice group who was also rejected. Um, they got some contentions um, remanded back to the licensing board. So I expect the licensing board to make short shrift of those remanded contentions. And then all opponents will be out of the NRC proceeding, rejected, and we will be appealing to the federal courts, the second highest court in the land, the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. So Beyond Nuclear and Don't Waste Michigan Coalition faces uh, a 60 day deadline from April 22nd, and we will meet it. We fully intend on fighting this for as long as it takes. And Beyond Nuclear's contention, our legal objection is that the proposal is illegal under federal law. It's called the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982 as amended. The illegal provision in their license application is they want the Department of Energy to essentially take ownership of commercial irradiated nuclear fuel at this interim storage site. That is prohibited by this law if there is not a repository open. And there is not a repository open. There can't be until mid-century, says the Department of Energy. So NRC has processed and approved now an illegal application. And federal agencies can't break the law. There's actually the Administrative Procedure Act says to federal agencies, essentially, you can't break the law. So they're breaking two laws at the NRC. And we hope and pray that the uh, three judge panel at the DC Circuit Court of Appeals will agree with our, our legal arguments. Uh, Kevin, are all of these, is all of this litigation going on remotely? Are any lawyers We're appearing not really in? Sure. We're not really sure yet how it's going to be handled. I know the Supreme Court is conducting business remotely. Um, I'm not sure how the DC Circuit Court of Appeals is, but we will certainly meet you know, the filing deadlines. In fact, we've already been, Beyond Nuclear has already been before this court for, it seems like a year or two already, trying to get the court to force the NRC to stop processing this illegal application. NRC refused to stop. And unfortunately, the court thus far said, the case is not ripe. You need to exhaust all remedies at the NRC. Our argument was it's illegal what they're doing. They should be forced to stop. So now it is over for us at the NRC. They have ruled against us at the highest level at the commission. And uh, yeah, so we'll meet the deadlines and we'll see how the court handles its business you know, remotely um, or in person in the future once safe to do so. I'm not sure. Yeah. And Kevin, to speak to the small voices, the, my, the viewers here and myself, who, uh, what can we do at this point? Well, um, there is a draft environmental impact statement by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission staff about the Holtec New Mexico consolidated storage. And uh, Vermonters and your, your audience uh, can certainly take part in that. And again, at beyondnuclear.org, I will post all of the ways that you can take part in this draft EIS public comment period, including um, we have sample comp comments, sample talking points that you can use verbatim if you want, or you can use them as models to write your own <clears throat> for submission to this NRC email address. The deadline is July 22nd. One of the things we're really calling for across the country is for Americans to contact their U.S. representative and both their U.S. senators and request of their members of Congress that they write to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and demand for their congressional district, for their state, that in-person public comment meetings be held by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission having to do with this matter. So, I mean, you've got the environmental injustice of the New Mexico proposal. These are Hispanic communities near Native American reservations being targeted. But you also have the, the Vermont impacts of shipping high-level radioactive waste out west. And a little known part of it is that the southwestern corner of Vermont happens to have a rail line that will serve not only as the corridor for Vermont Yankees waste, but for other states waste. And I believe it is uh, Seabrook in New Hampshire. That's a lot of high level radioactive waste that is going to be clipping that southwestern corner of Vermont as it moves westward. Of course, uh, Yankee Row is another possibility so close to Vermont. Pilgrim near Boston is another possibility. These are other states, high level radioactive wastes directly impacting Vermont. And uh, this is a very high risk undertaking. And so the people of Vermont deserve a say, they deserve a public comment meeting in person. And in fact, I've been um, alluding to the iconic painting by Rockwell um, entitled Freedom of Speech. 
where a man is standing up in town meeting and uh, holding forth and you can tell he's nervous, but he's also determined to say what he has to say and his neighbors are listening intently or not, <laughs> some of them in the painting. And that's what we deserve. It's our right as Americans to be able to look each other in the eye, say what we have to say. And the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and Holtec to their shame are keeping secret all of these transportation impacts. So they've been doing that from the start and we need to get this warning out to the American people that, that these mobile Chernobyls, these dirty bombs on wheels, these mobile X-ray machines that can't be turned off, in terms of barge shipments, these floating Fukushimas are heading your way unless we stop them. And uh, these public comment meetings are a great opportunity to educate the public and we cannot be denied this opportunity. Thank you, Kevin Camps, Nuclear Waste Watchdog for Beyond Nuclear. And please, please uh, return as my guest, even though we are all remote now. But, uh, but the, the, the challenge is, is present, it's vital, and uh, it's right here in this moment. And thank you very much for all your work, Kevin. Thank you for hosting me and for all your work. And you know, I'll just point out the, the connections between where I'm sitting in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and where you're sitting in Burlington, Vermont. Entergy owns both Vermont Yankee and Palisades. And I'm going to encourage my friends and colleagues in Southwestern Michigan, watchdogs on Palisades, to take part in the Vermont Yankee decommissioning community advisory panel that's coming up because we all have to work together to address these risks um, across the country. Thank you, Kevin Camps. Until next time, the journey continues. Yes. Thank you. Be safe. Thank you, Kevin.